Our next speaker is a, an amazing lady, okay? She was elected to the Selangor State Assembly at the age of 29. Now, how many of you um, are 29 years old or below? <laughs> ah, you still have a chance. <laughs> the rest of you, all right, sorry. But I'm sure you can do some other things. I'm sure there are other things that uh, you can be gifted to do, right? And um, she is also the first female and the youngest ever speaker at the Malaysian Legislative Assembly. Now, why? She had a vision when she was young. She, and she followed that vision. She took it through. She has a passion, and her passion is nation building. And she wants to involve people, ordinary Malaysians like you and me, to contribute to nation building so that we can build a nation that is righteous, free from corruption, free from racial discrimination. Wow, that's a big dream and that's a big vision. And I believe that she is able to do it. I really believe in her. When I um, uh, saw her being elected in 2008, let me tell you, I was very excited. She, she, um, I, I read up about her and I saw that and my heart, my heart was leaping with joy. And I think we need a lot of young people like her. And um, she inspires. She inspires people like you and me. At whatever age, actually, we can still contribute, okay? So without much ado, I'll just invite her to share her story with you. Thank you. Um, I'll be very, very fast because I have a flight uh, to catch in one hour's time. Um, for those of you who are seated there, my presentation is really based on this slide, uh, PowerPoint photos. So you really need to have a look at the photos. Uh, you may want to move over slightly over to this side, because otherwise you won't be able to follow. Okay, uh, I was young and slim when I first joined politics. At the age of 29, I joined uh, the DAP uh, simply because two reasons. Uh, I really wanted to put an end to race-based politics in Malaysia. Secondly, I really despise the corruption that is happening in this country. I think as long as you have corruption, then a lot of things will not change. So armed with two motives, um, I was recruited by my friend Edward Lim uh, to join DAP when Tony Poa started his service centre. This was back in 2007, before the great change happened in 2008. Okay, uh, I studied law, practiced law for three years, and then I was an event manager. So I used my skill in politics. At that time, I was asked to organize, arrange for food and drinks for the opening of Tony Pa Service Center. Now, if you have similar skills, you can also uh, make good use of the skill because in political parties, we organize a lot of events. And that's how a lot of great things start, you know, from small little, little steps. And so you can see the photograph there, those were the food and quays that I arranged. My first service for the DAP. And then uh, I got married in 2008, January. But the, ne the very next month, uh, Patla dissolved parliament and I was asked to run uh, for Subang Jaya. I grew up in Subang Jaya, so uh, that I, I'm very, very passionate about my hometown. And so when I was offered that seat, uh, I was very nervous. Um, I was a church-going young professional at that time. And so before 2008 general elections, we were talking a lot about registering as voter, making change happen in our neighborhood, in our church. And so when the opportunity came, I had the option to shrink back and say, this is not for me, maybe it's for someone else, politics not for me. Or I had the option to take on that challenge and just face it, like what uh, Thomas said. And so I said, yes, I put this photo up because this was taken on nomination day uh, in public. You know, it was very, very scary because a lot of people tell you hor horrible stories. You know, you could be disqualified on nomination day because the candidate before me, that term, was disqualified because his paper was not in order. And so, very, very stressful. Okay? Um, I ran a very, very simple campaign. These were all my church friends, school friends, uncles, aunties and a few curious residents at the back. They wanted to find out who Hanayo is. Uh, so very humble beginning, very little money, 700 ringgit, but uh, people donated uh, funds to help the campaign happen. So uh, 
this was my campaign, basically just selling the idea to people that, you know, we want a stronger opposition in Selangor. Now, you must remember, at that point of time when we, ran, we were running that campaign, it's similar to what is happening in Sarawak now. The government, state government, was very strong. We only had two opposition seats at that time. And at that time, K. Toyo, the Menteri Besar, said he wanted zero opposition, which means he wanted to wipe out the, even the two chairs, the two seats. Okay? So everybody said, no, change is not possible. State government is just too strong. Same like what's happening in Sarawak now. Okay? Uh, and so we just gave it a go. I took two weeks of unpaid leave. My boss said, you're not going to win. Just go and contest, come back to work. <laughs> but to our horror, change happened so big that we changed the state government for the first time in the history of Selangor. And not just one state, five states at a time. Okay? So it's been seven years since then. Um, and I just focus a lot on the local issues in Subang Jaya. My first term, I had I won with a majority of 13,000. Second term in 2013, doubled the majority, 28,000. Okay. So as, a, and as an elected representative, you know, in Malaysian politics, it's not so difficult to shine. <laughs> You just have to exercise some common sense, passion in people, passion in your work, stay consistent, be consistent in what you say and your, in your principle, you do fine. And I'm not the only person, there are so many more uh, new people who have come in, they, they all you know, excel in their own ways, uh, no matter how young. And so you know in 2013, after we won, I was given the opportunity to become uh, the speaker now, I don't think at a time when they made me speaker, everybody was, uh, everybody, I, I don't think they appointed me because they wanted the first woman speaker. It sort of just happened when that job was given to me. Then everybody realized that, oh no, this is the first, first time that we have a woman speaker and this happened to be the youngest uh, speaker. And so, it made news because this is not common in Malaysian politics. Usually the position of speaker is given to someone very senior, in UMNO uh, or some leading parties and it's hardly given to a young person, a Chinese girl, a Christian girl and a young girl. Okay, uh, So that's why it made uh, even international news, uh, China and Taiwan covered this news. Okay, So this is the state assembly uh, that I preside over. Okay, on my right, uh, the state, minister, uh, state ministers, on my left, the opposition. So, in seven years, I suddenly find myself from an event manager to working with the top civil servants in the state. And uh, going in and out, attending functions with chief minister, uh, statesmen and rulers. Okay, in just seven years. So, I remember at that time when I wanted to join politics and I wanted to contest, um, a senior pastor um, told me that, you know, as a Christian, if you get involved in politics, you may be tainted just like everyone else. You go in clean, but you will walk out corrupt because the corruption is too great and it's too difficult. One person cannot make a difference. It's too difficult to bring change in Malaysia. Okay? As a result, stay away from it. So that was seven years ago. But what has happened? If you face fear and you are determined to say, no, I will not subscribe to status quo, one person can make a difference and that's my aim now really to become a good role model for others to see that you can be young, inexperienced, you go in and you can remain clean and you can even excel if you don't participate in class. So seven years ago they say impossible, cannot, good people cannot rise in politics, good people will never shine. You know, if you are clean you will be, um, you know, they, they, they will put you in cold storage, you just won't, you, you won't shine. I'm here to tell you that that's not true. If you join the right party, you have enough good support, good structure, good people around you who will say, you know, let's do it, I believe in you, you can do it. And I'm thankful that in my party, the DAP, there are enough good people in there, in the top leadership, in the central leadership, who believe in empowering women, empowering young people, and they are very open, you know, you have good ideas, you run it, you do it. Okay. Um, and very supportive, and as a result, um, this, uh, this is where I have come, seven years. Okay? 
and today I dine with rulers. <laughs> now, I really believe um, that we are tested, people in power are tested when they have powers. You want to know whether they are sincere in bringing reforms, you test them when they have power, not when they are opposition, they talk about going there. So you want to judge Pakata Rakyat, you rightfully so, you have to look at Penang, you have to look at Selangor and how they perform. And if you think that they deserve a chance at Putrajaya, you have to support us. And so as the only woman speaker, uh, I have to prove to people that Pakatan can do it, woman can do it, young person can do it. So there's a lot of stress on me to perform as a speaker uh, and to make sure that I can bring reforms. And so in the last um, two years, I've worked very hard at bringing it about uh, or putting in stone some of these reforms uh, that have started since 2008. So we have started with live telecasts uh, of our seating to ensure that there's greater transparency and that no laws will ever be made in secret again in the State Assembly. And so that started in 2008. What, what I've done, I have amended the standing orders. The standing orders are just rules uh, governing the State Assembly. We amended that to make sure that it's stated in there. That from now onwards, st uh, the seating of the State Assembly, if we own television, it must be on television. If not, it must be on website, live telecasted to people. Secondly, we have also amended the standing orders to say the Chairman of the Public Accounts Committee, looking into the management of funds in the state and how states spend money, must be led by the opposition leader. Even though we are government now, but we change that and make sure that it's protected in our standing orders that for generations to come in Slango, it must always be led and chaired by the opposition leader. So we have amended that in our standing orders. Third amendment to the standing orders, a lot of, standing or, uh, a lot of select committees like Public Accounts Committee, CELCAT, their duty is to report to the House their status of their investigation on certain issues. So they, their duty is to present a report. But it's up to the government whether or not they want to respond to those reports. So you know there's a lot of talk in Parliament also, Public Accounts Committee or even the Select Committee uh, on you know, Versailles, Versailles hearing and all that, whether or not the government would actually respond to your recommendations uh, and ideas. But we have changed our standing orders to say government must give an official response to our recommendations in the next sitting. So this, this sitting, we table you a report, next sitting you must come back to the house and report to us what have you done with our recommendations. So our standing orders have been amended. The only one eh, in Malaysia State Assembly, Selangor has done that. Next one is to empower opposition leader. Now opposition leader in Selangor is UMNO. We only have 12 of them left uh, out of 56. Um, so when we came in, we realized that, okay, you know, Chief Minister has official car, Speaker has official car, Expos have official car. What about the opposition leader? And if you search the enactment, there's very little resources made available to the opposition leader. Now, if you want good check and balance, you have to empower them. So we change it and make sure that he receives a fixed allowance of 3,000 ringgit every month. He gets an official car, same Camry, brand new, like the Chief Minister and the Speaker, same car. Okay? He will get an office and a secretary and petrol claim up to 2,000 ringgit. All this is made available to the opposition leader and he received it. But the moment we amended the standing orders and said, okay, now do your work, opposition leader, you have to chair PAC, he resigned as the opposition leader. Okay, Simply because I think they do not want to take this up, knowing full well that in all other states in Malaysia, they will be pressured to do the same for the opposition leader in those states. So today, we don't have an op opposition leader in Selangor. They do not want that position. We already knew that they probably this would be the outcome. And so we have also amended our standing orders to make sure that if the chairman does not call for meeting, the speaker can appoint another person to chair the meeting first until you have an opposition leader. So PAC now is running, okay? Um, there's a second AMNO man in the committee. He doesn't want it as well. So now it goes back to Pakatan to lead it. But it's already protected in our standing order. Whoever becomes the opposition leader next will immediately receive all these uh, special uh, provisions and also chair the uh, public accounts committee. Now, one of the things I look at uh, that I can bring about change or to pressure at least other state assemblies to follow would be to create an open space for debate, an open culture for debate. 
uh, and not reject you know, motions because it's submitted by the opposition. And so, since 2013 up to now, um, after I became Speaker, we have allowed motions to be tabled by opposition, the end, okay? And we have gone even way ahead by passing three of such motions by opposition. Now, you need majority in the House to be able to pass these motions. How can 12 AMNO men, okay? Not even, we have two-third majority. 12 AMNO men, they are able to pass their motions in the House. Why? Because when the motion makes sense to the other reps, in Selangor, there's a great level of maturity among the assembly person. You know, they, they vote across party lines. So if you, I can agree with your motion, I will vote in favour. So as a result, now there's a culture, you know, that that's an openness in the House. If it's UMNO, the motion, if it makes sense, let's vote in favour. So this is very healthy. We have, I have even allowed an emergency motion brought by UMNO. Emergency motion means that you set aside the other agenda of government, agenda of the uh, House, put that aside and debate that motion by the opposition leader during the water rationing crisis. Yeah. So now, I think they expect to be heard. Uh, every sitting now, you will have motions tabled by UMNO. And we have no problem allowing it to be debated and to be passed. So other speakers, other state assemblies want to see, you know, how do you actually control debate like that? It's live telecast. People have to be responsible for their own behaviour. These are elected reps, you know. So you don't even have to chase them out. They have to behave because people can see them see them for who they are. So when you have transparency, you can expect accountability. And you know, this thing will just follow. Okay? We have also uh, designed a new website. All our select committee reports are all, the moment it's approved, it will be loaded online. You can have access to all these papers. You know, these are all done investigation and hearings on GLCs, on local government, land office. Uh, on issues, uh, how they spend money, you know, you can have access to all these papers. We also want to empower the next generation. A lot of young people don't know how laws are made, how they can participate. So we have launched Adu Muda, it's basically youth parliament. After every sitting, we will select 56 people to go in and debate. Two days program, teach them how to, uh, how to write a, uh, a motion, how to debate, and how, uh, how to engage uh, other lawmakers. Uh, so, this is what we're doing and some of them, uh, the, the criteria you must be 18 to 24, live in Selangor or study in Selangor. So we do get applicants from Sarawak and Sabah. And this is our way of wanting to bring change even to the young people here, to give them exposure if they are studying in Selangor. This is my last slide. A picture speaks a thousand words. You know, if you think that it's impossible to bring change um, to a few, where minority just do not have a place, or you, a lot of people say, you know, women cannot do it. I will challenge you and say, you know, never say never. This is a conference of speakers in Malaysia. These are all speakers from other state assemblies. Okay? Where the red arrow is, that's the speaker of Slamo. <laughs> I am not intimidated at all uh, now, two years after that, because I know that. Um, Despite my age, my gender, you know, if I'm serious about bringing reforms, I can shine like other men and other seniors. And, and and so in a playground, you know, where men excel and people say it's impossible. Seven years ago, everybody says it's impossible. Take unpaid leave, come back to work. You know, you're not going to make any change. The Slango government will never, never fall. Um, you know, it's impossible. And if you think Sarawak is impossible, I want to challenge you today. Please remember this story that anything is possible, really. If it can happen to an ordinary girl like me, I only organized Quay for the DAP before 2008. You know, you can do it also. Yeah. So never write off anyone and think that it's impossible. Uh, and, and don't speak hopelessness into the situation. I think we all need some kind of... Uh, stories like that to inspire us to, to believe that change can happen. So with that, thank you so much for coming tonight. I hope that you know from tonight onwards you will you will you will start saying that you know it is possible to bring change in Sarawak. Thank you.
Okay, we are moving forward slightly the Q&A session in respect of uh, Webby Hannah uh, because of the time she has to go at 9.30 so we're moving forward that section of the Q&A and then um, resuming thereafter so um, for the next 10 minutes feel free to I think what we'll do is maybe take two questions and then let Webby Hannah answer them is that fine? Verbally, you can forward the questions and or if you feel shy, just write it on that little uh, slip of paper that we were given earlier on when you came in. Yeah. Question, question there. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, Bhai Bihana, uh, how much do you spend on your last, uh, your last election? And how do you get a financing for it? Um, my first election, I spent about 30 over 1,000 ringgit. Uh, second one, I cannot really remember, but it's very, very minimal. Uh, because the second one, we were more coordinated, so I could share the cost with my member of parliament, the parliamentary candidate. Uh, basically, we, we, we spend very, very minimal because we don't believe in giving free food to people and attracting crowd to come to our churamas. So we only pay for some system, we pay for billboards, we pay for banners and uh, food and drinks for our volunteers who go and walk about with us. So that's, that's all we spend, very, very minimal. And, and trust me, if you run an election, you have friends and people who, who help support you nowadays, it's, it's quite easy to raise funds for your campaign. All you have to do is you know, ask everybody to contribute one day if you believe in the cause, and people will give. During campaign time, especially at rallies, charamas, you can easily raise 10 to 20,000 ringgit at a Pakatan rally, charama. You know, people really come and give. Uh, uh, and a lot of people feel that, you know, that's the least I could do. I, I cannot run, but I can support you. And so people give very generously in uh, Chiramas. Next question. Next question. Okay, one thing that we have also done is to employ researchers. So we have three uh, law grads, uh, researchers, to help us. These researchers also provide services to not just Pakatan assemblymen, also to BN assemblymen during SIDAP. And so I, I take in a lot of interns and I always tell them, look, I don't have the time, but please go and do research, go and look at commonwealth practices. And if you think that it's possible to do it here, let me know. And if I can push it through, you know, I will want to do it. And so this is just a combination of researchers and also to read and, and find out what's the culture in other state assemblies uh, and push through, yeah. Some more? You know, to introduce change is not easy. Even in the beginning, uh, even our teammates were very skeptical, you know, is it really possible? But, you know, you want to make him the PAC chairman, but what if he doesn't call for a meeting? You know, you can always you can find excuses if you want to, but you can also find a way out. And then you look at the standing orders easily. You can always empower the speaker. Just appoint another person to chair a meeting if you don't have an opposition leader. So we managed, after a few months, uh, to, to persuade the rest and to push through uh, this reform. How do you attract agents to join How do I attract interns to join us? Um, you cannot attract how do I say this? Uh, we don't pay people at all. So you want to, I want to be able to attract the right people. So I'm not interested in young people who do not believe in changes and they don't want to learn. Uh, so that's why we don't pay them. And we say, you know, if you want to learn, you come on board. Uh, I don't restrict you. You can stay with me for six months. You can stay with me for two weeks. It's really up to you. Uh, the amount you want to learn is the amount I will teach. And so we, I have had, uh, I've had interns who have interned with us for six months, some for two weeks, some came a few days and couldn't take frontline complaints and they left. Yeah. So uh, it's easier to take in young interns simply because when I, op I when I open my office for uh, service centre night, when people come with their problems and I have a young person sitting next to me, I say, sorry, this is my student. Are you okay with my student sitting here? But if I have a senior citizen, I cannot say this is my student. <laughs> Uh, it will be a bit awkward lah. Yeah, so for the older people, usually we just call them volunteer, we don't call them interns. Yeah. So older people do come and volunteer their time to sit in the office and to help frontline complaints. Yeah. Sorry, uh, okay. Um, what if, like, uh, you say you uh, face an obstacle, people discourage you, how do you overcome it? I think all of us will face similar fears. Um, 
you know, how will my life change? Am I really ready to become a public figure? Uh, and I think after my first two years after I won, I became a bit bitter also with the circumstances. I feel like I'm being, I, I felt, felt cheated. I wanted to just become a stronger opposition. Suddenly, how come I be, end up becoming government and we are expected to solve problems and not just raise issues and do PCs and highlight problems? And so the first two years were very, very difficult uh, understanding the issues because I didn't have experience in politics. So I have to learn all the local issues, learn, you know, if I have this problem, which agency do I go? How do I resolve a very difficult situation in the local community when you have the business community fighting with the local residents? So all this will come with experience. Uh, and I think it's, it's okay that it's good that you start, you start young um, because people are more forgi forgiving, you know? Uh, and I think so, I think so. Um, yeah, seven years is, is okay now. Uh, I, I think it's impossible to solve all the problems, but I think people just want to see some reforms. People want to see that, you know, yeah, good changes are happening. Even if you cannot solve everything, uh, it's better than the situation now. Things are rotting. It's not improving. Yeah. What you going? Is it faith? Faith plays a very important part uh, in my journey. Uh, I don't think I can do this uh, without God. Uh, and the strength that he gave me. But I also think that uh, what keeps us going, especially for us in the opposition, is the greater the injustice, it gives you more reason to wake up every morning and do this. Yeah. So when you read the news and you find people are still dying in detention, uh, corruption is still happening so blatantly before our eyes, and, and they are not even sorry uh, for cases that, they, that were exposed. People are being killed. Uh, and you don't know how to account for their murder. Um, things like that, you know, will keep us going. We just feel that if we stop now, you know, then nobody will work at it. You know, we just have to keep going until we have enough good people. Everybody come along, then the burden becomes lighter. I have a written question here. Written question. Wait, I take that question first. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Just now you mentioned that you like very fast. Yes. Like yes. Fast. yes. Do you also, at the same time, publish the Hansa report? Yes. Hansa is all made public in uh, our uh, day one website. So you can actually go and have a look. Who was the website? Who, what? This is the website. Day one dot slango dot gov dot my. Yeah. So you can check the Hansa. But Hansa are very boring because people talk for long, long hours. <laughs> so you have to go and search for who you want to listen to. Yeah. Day one dot slango dot gov dot my. The question is, uh, how do you persuade people who say, I'm not interested in politics or I don't have time? How, how does, how does as a citizen, how you come across such people, friends? Or... <laughs> I think at the end of the day, no amount of convincing can help if the person doesn't cross that line, doesn't take that step himself or herself, you know? Uh, so we can only do this kind of amount of sharing, uh, conversations and hopefully share enough good stories to inspire people. Uh, but at the end of the day, I think it rests on the individual to make the decision to count the cost and be willing to pay the price. You know? So in 2008, uh, there, there, there was a cost that we had to pay uh, to put our head out there as an opposition rep even before we were strong enough to become government and be, be willing to pay the price there. Just now you mentioned that you allow your party, allow your member to support the law. Yes. Yes. For the new or for the more organization. Does your party practice a party quick system? No. In Salamo, the motions, right, if they agree with you, you know, there are motions like uh, we think the government should do more to fight dengue, uh, local government should monitor development projects more. You know, motions like that. Even the UMNO people think that it's crucial. Same with Pakatan reps. In fact, in our state assembly, you will find the Pakatan reps are more vocal in checking on their own state government. And I think this is the culture we want, you know, that you don't produce yes men, that the state assembly is not a rubber stamp institution. Yeah. So we have proven that it can be done in Selangor. Nobody has been suspended for voting in, uh, you know, to pass the UMNO's motion. Nobody. With greater transparency, how come the water agreement was like uh, not known? With greater transparency, how come the water agreement was not known? That was why we had to change the chief minister who signed the agreement. Yeah. So that's why we made that move. Yeah. The water agreement, we have a freedom of information enactment. 
we have also done a public hearing, self-care public hearing to check, you know, why was the water agreement, the application for the water agreement not given. And the State Secretary has uh, testified at the hearing to say that our Freedom of Information enactment now says that, you know, if there is a third party there, you need a third party's consent. And so the State Government has written to the Federal Government and say, you know, there is an application we would like to pub, pub, uh, release or uh, disclose this agreement that we have signed, but the Federal uh, uh, government, government has not agreed to us disclosing it. Yeah. So we have made a recommendation, CELCAP, the Select Committee, we say from now onwards, government contracts, if you want to do business with Sinalo, there should be an automatic disclosure clause there to say we have FOI, so you know, if you want to do business with us, at any time, if this agreement is going to be requested by someone, it should be automatically disclosed without seeking your consent. So that is our recommendation. And we await the government's response to that recommendation in this coming sitting in August. State, yeah, state enactment. What do you call against the... That's what BN said. When BN debated that, agree, uh, that enactment in the House, they said that it's against the Official Secret Act. Okay? But we did a consultation. We didn't pass law like what Parliament did until 4 a.m. We actually adjourned it to, a, uh, uh, to committee stage where we took... The, the, there was a special select committee to discuss that bill. Uh, and we consulted Bar Council. Bar Council came and said, you just have to push the legal boundaries. They say it cannot be done, just do it because this is good. It's the first sunshine law in the country. If they want to take you to court, let them take you to court. And so because of that, we pushed you. Until now, we have not been sued for going against the official secret act. You will actually get a royal consent for For freedom of information? Yeah. Yes. Even without royal assent, it becomes law after 30 days if it's passed by the House. Uh, that is the yes, yes. Can we take two more questions? Two more? Yeah. Yes. What has been your biggest challenge in your seven years of your political career? My biggest challenge is the lack of political education among voters. So people all come expecting you to change the sky, uh, <laughs> expecting Subhan Jaya to transform miraculously the next day, you know. When they voted for change on the 8th of March, on the 9th of March, they expected no traffic jam. <laughs> uh, until today, I have people who say, because I still see a rat in SS15 Subhan Jaya, I'm going to vote you out. Don't expect me to donate money to you anymore because I still see a rat. Uh, so there are a lot of local issues because we don't have local government election. Uh, and people get frustrated because they don't know their councillors. Uh, some of them don't know. And so they just expect the state assemblyman or the member of parliament to resolve a lot of local issues. And local issues, you cannot win. If two neighbours are fighting, you take one side, both are voters, one person is going to be very upset. Okay? Double parking. You push for enforcement, rightfully so. Okay? The person who pushes will be very, hap uh, very happy. The people who receive summon then land up in our office. Okay? And, and, and issues like that, I have learned to just really let the local council deal with it because I'll be wasting my time trying to tackle issues that I don't think state assembly person are elected to solve issues like that, double parking. You know? We have local councils, let the local councils deal with that and I should be pushing for state reforms, legislative reforms like this. Yeah. Whether you're having local government elections in this like Okay, Selangor, um, I think Penang has gone ahead of us. Penang passed the enactment, uh, but Penang has not been challenged. Anything, but not doing anything. Yeah, Penang has been challenged in court, uh, and they have been proven that they cannot. Okay, so Selangor was watching Penang, uh, and of course, until today, if you ask me, I want local government elections because that will take the burden off me. I don't have to go catch rats on Saturday and Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> so I am a supporter of local government elections because I know I will benefit from that system, um, but. Unfortunately, that's the scenario now. With Penang having even a state law, EC say you cannot, you cannot do it. In West Malaysia, the local city council are all governed by the local government act. We have local government act, okay, but the councillors are appointed by the state government. So, but that's because of the act, sir. Yeah. Sarawak is different because Sarawak we have a local government ordinance, and our DB player is a different thing. DB player, secondary. 
So in Salah, it's easier to have a local government election because we don't have to be such So then you should be pushing for it since it's easier for you. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Correct, <laughs> correct. <laughs> Any more? Only one more thing. One more question, one yes. More question, yes. Oh. Is politician is family first or the church first? I think um, for me, I will tell you it's family first. That's why I'm taking the flight out tonight because my daughter has to go to school in the morning and I have to get her ready for school. I think it's so important that uh, our family life is not affected because I think people will judge you by how you manage your household before you can manage your country. Uh, and that's why people who commit adultery get punished. <laughs> because if you cannot sort out your personal life, very unlikely you'll be able to manage uh, country's finances and country's affairs. So, you know, many times they say if you cannot stay faithful to your wife, you know, how can we, uh, if you can cheat on your wife, you can also cheat on the voters. Um, <laughs> so if you ask me, family is very important. And I'm very blessed to have a very supportive husband. I have a good family structure. Like my parents are there to help me, uh, and friends and good friends will help me yeah, in my office and all. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you.